Welcome back to Streets and Eats, everyone. And this week we have an exciting guest on the podcast, and it's Jen Lloyd from Sick Girl Travels. And she's got some really cool stories to tell us about rescuing dogs in China. Welcome to Streets and Eats, the podcast where we want to inspire your next trip by telling you about some fantastic destinations and the best food to eat while you're there. Now remember, until the world opens completely back up and you feel safe to travel again, use this time to research and plan. That's what we're here for. Hi, Jen. Hi, pleasure to be here. Yeah, Hi, Jen. we're excited to have you. It's the end of the of the calendar year. We're getting close to the holidays, but what a great time to talk about volunteerism and rescuing those poor dogs. Tell us a little bit about it. How did you get, um, you know, involved in rescuing dogs from the meat market? So I was volunteering with a rescue that was local here in Los Angeles, where I'm based, and they are predominantly bulldog rescue. And I'd fostered with them a number of times that I saw on Instagram that they had posted that they needed someone who had a Chinese uh, visa, tourist visa, that could go over to Harbin, China, and um, was comfortable going alone to um, help fly back some dogs that were rescued from the uh, meat trade there in China. And I had been to China before to Beijing as a, a tourist once on a solo trip and had a visa that was still active and was more than happy to go over there after, you know, doing some due diligence because I was still worried about going over to a foreign country with people I didn't know and if this was a reputable organization and whatnot. Sure. Um, but after doing some research, I was gung-ho about getting on that plane and helping out in whatever way possible. Um, but yeah, my first trip there was a little bit of a shock to the system because I went in January and it was uh, below, it was about 30 below zero in Fahrenheit. Um, so quite, quite cold. <laughs> yeah. Quite cold. Uh, the bulk of the people over there at that time were going for the Harbin Snow and Ice Festival, which is a big draw there um, to people who have been before. It's an entire city created out of snow and ice. Yeah, so most of the people list. there. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning to see. And I, I highly recommend anybody, if you're going to China, go check it out. It's really, really amazing. And, and not on a lot of people's radars. People mostly, you know, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai is kind of where people usually go. Um, but yeah, I went over there and helped volunteer at their safe house and care for some of the dogs that were there. I think at the time they had about 200 dogs wow. at the safe house. And then my first trip, I flew back 10 dogs to the U.S. Um, for fosters and then were eventually adopted into their forever homes here in the United States. So That's really how, cool. how are they rescued? Like, what do these volunteers do to get them? I mean, how do they do it? Right. So the important thing for the rescue that I work with, and I know each rescue is sort of different, but a good rescue will um, work with the local citizens there in China, because what we don't want is to come in and impose Western values and go, hey, guys, don't eat dog. It's not how we do it. Um, we're telling you what to do. Give us the dogs. Uh, the other thing that's important is that we also don't want to pay for dogs, which I think a lot of organizations will do. And it's very hard not to do when you're faced with seeing that meat truck and somebody going, we won't give you these dogs unless you pay for them. But the problem is if you're handing over money, it just lets the meat dealers buy more dogs. And so you're in this never ending sort of cycle of paying these people to then get more dogs and then have to pay to rescue them. And it goes on and on. So um, it's just tragic. Yeah. It is tragic. I have a one bit of good news that came out of COVID um, is that the laws have changed in China, fortunately, mm -hmm. that they really saw um, this, you know, dog meat as being a problem coming out of these wet markets and things that the, you know, dogs are not vaccinated there that end up in the meat trade. And so it's just breeding distemper and parvo and other, you know, canine coronaviruses and things that are making the dogs and people very sick. So mm -hmm. China, um, for a lot of pr um, pressure put on them, had decided to take dogs off of the livestock list. So they are no longer, you can no longer legally serve dog in a dog meat restaurant. You can no longer legally sell dog for the purposes of, of meat. Um, However, that's not to say people don't do it because sure, right. just like yeah, murder is illegal it. here, people do it. <laughs> well, anyway, I mean, thousands of years of culture. And from what I understand, one of the reasons people do eat dog in the Asian cultures is that they feel that it gives them strength, that it's, you know, it's transferred a, a type of 
like fortitude to them. And so, I mean, and that's something, like you said, we don't want to come in and change our culture, but at the other side of the coin, you know. It's part of it. There, There's a few layers to this. I think in Harbin, where it's very Northern China, there is a belief that if you eat dog, it will keep you warm and it'll keep you strong throughout the winter, which is sort of a hard thing to convince people that it doesn't have these magical powers. Um, however, if you look at something like Yulin, that's not something that's been going on for, you know, even more than a decade. It's something that was thought up to bring tourists into an area and to get people to, you know, come to the city and come in. It's not something that's deeply entrenched in culture. It's not something that's been passed down for hundreds of years as, you know, I thought getting involved in this, I was like, oh, that's it. They, you know, who am I to tell them they can't do this? It's just like them coming here and saying, you can't eat chicken or what? like, I'd go, you're crazy. That's really <laughs> what we eat and stop. Um, but it's it's not as tied to culture as we would think. It is something that's also not tied to poverty. Um, dog meat in a lot of these places like um, Harbin is um, sort of a social status thing that if you can afford to go to a dog meat re- restaurant, it's you know a notch in your belt. Um, so it is like a fine dining experience in some places. Um, so it. You know, to dispel some rumors, it's not always just born out of poverty. There are certainly people that, you know, raise dogs and eat dogs because it's the only thing that's available to them. But it's predominantly not the main reason throughout China. Wow. I did not know that. But it's like you said. Well, first of all, China is a huge country. And just like the United States, you know, each region has its own cultural history and background. So that makes sense that certain areas would be more prone to it than others, I think. Sure, sure. It's um, like something that in the northern, in northern China, sorry, in northern China, you don't see a lot of um, people eating cat meat or selling cat meat. That's something that you do, however, see a lot of in southern China. But like you're saying, tons of different cultures, tons of different traditions throughout different areas, and it varies wherever you go. That is really interesting. It's nice that they've changed the law to include dogs and hopefully cats too. But like you said, it's been going on for so long that just changing the law, I'm sure, isn't going to do away with the practice completely. So they'll still need volunteers. They absolutely do. And it's also incumbent upon these rescues there in China to enforce the law because you have to deal with then the agriculture department when you come upon one of these slaughterhouses or you come upon one of these breeding uh, facilities to go, this is illegal, let's get the authorities involved. Um, I think there are still some bad rescues. I won't name names, but people you know, like posting these graphic images because it brings in money. Right. So if you're seeing a rescue that is just graphic video after graphic video, please question, are they using the law? Because it does help with donations. And that's, you know, I know these these organizations do really need money to operate, but it's, you know, to put an end to this, you really have to get the authorities on your side and start making these places close down. So on your first trip to China, when you went to Harbin, and you were able to get the 10 dogs out. I read on your blog that it was quite the experience. And I I traveled I um, the very first time I was in China. I traveled with my daughters to Xi'an um, and Beijing. And we got stuck in Shanghai overnight. But we didn't get there until midnight. And we, I mean, it was pretty much a heron experience. And here I am with my two teenage daughters thinking, uh, what the heck have I gotten myself into here? <laughs> And of course, as travel does, it all worked out and and it did for you as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I think it's a fascinating story. I can't imagine doing that with 10 dogs. It's it's been an adventure. I will say the very first time I went, it went pretty smoothly. It was a shock to the system to see, you know, what was happening over there. But it went smoothly as far as travel goes. So I was like, I'll come back, whatever, guys. I, this has been a great experience. I'm glad to help. The second time I came back, um, I was just going to meet dogs in Beijing and then uh, spend one night and fly them back to mm-hmm. the U.S., to, to Los Angeles. However, <laughs> uh, Ava Airways, which I was flying on, was having a strike at the time. So they had um, had canceled my ticket and then rebooked me, but they didn't rebook the dogs. So I was then at the Beijing airport and they said, you can go back to LA, but the dogs can't. So I said, well, that's the whole reason they've come here. 
I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. I called the girls at the rescue who are based in Harbin and they were like, well, we can rebook you on a flight. But the bad news is the only flight available is to go on Aeroflot um, from Beijing to Moscow, Moscow all the way back around to LA. So I literally flew around the world. (laughs) That's an added uh... benefit. (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) It's not really the way that I wanted to say that I flew around the world. (laughs) That wasn't on your bucket list? (laughs) No. (laughs) It was not on my bucket list at all. You're an RTW traveler. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So I ended up being able to get back on this plane and had a layover in in moscow for it was like eight hours and i had um the dogs you know in cargo they take great care of them and they take them out and feed them and walk them but you know i'm stuck in the moscow airport with one of the dogs that i had as a hand luggage was a you know tiny tiny little guy and i um (laughs) <laughs> just got a sleep pod in the Moscow airport and let him like run around in the pod as I'm <laughs> trying to get some rest <laughs> before hopping on the plane to go back around the world. So it was a real, you know, huge adventure for me and sort of scary because I didn't want to have them, you know, have spent all this money on tickets to to get to China just to go, hi dogs, I'm leaving, good luck <laughs> and go back I home. Know. So I, you know, agreed to it, but it was so an adventure and luckily everybody got where they needed to go in the end but it was yeah that was a lot of hours <laughs> i can so imagine. is there a lot of red tape involved i mean um dogs yeah you know there is a lot of paperwork involved and again another downside that's happened um from covid really is that the united states government has put a lot of restrictions on dogs coming into the u.s so the cdc now has blocked any dogs coming in from china so if and when i'm able to go um to china again and rescue dogs i can't bring them back to the u.s i would happily volunteer as a flight volunteer take them to canada or i think Germany and France still allow in dogs, Um, but they've gotten not so much on COVID, which is, you know, the Chinese government still has a belief that dogs can transmit COVID to people. We know here that that's not possible, Um, but the CDC is concerned about countries where they have um, rabies. Mm. And again, good organizations are, you know, you can test. They have the paperwork. I bring over a little passports with the dogs that show they've all been vaccinated and everything's on the up and up. Unfortunately, they've had a few bad organizations where dogs have come into the country sick. And so Mm. that's really, um, you know, put a stop to things for the time being. I hope that they're able to enact stricter regulations on dogs coming over so people can't exploit the system. Um, I think a lot of dogs do come in for breeding purposes, unfortunately, from places like Eastern Europe which, you know, it hurts because we want to do what's right for these dogs that have been through so much abuse and so much trauma and get them good homes here. And it's thwarted by greedy people, unfortunately. So we'll see where that ends up. But yeah. So you had said earlier that you wanted to really vet the organization. Have you volunteered before? And how do you do the research to know that it's a reputable um, organization that you that you can trust and, you know, traips out of the country for sure no i i recommend that anybody that's considering volunteering overseas really if you see something on on social media that's like hey we're looking for volunteers really reach out to other people that are commenting or other people that you see that have volunteered for that organization and say hey what was your experience like and not just one person because you never know if they're like especially if they tell you contact this person then go i don't know about that um you really want to reach out to independently people that you see that have volunteered through that organization because you you don't want to get all the way there and be surprised that it's not on the up and up and you're or you know you're stuck somewhere nobody comes to get you because especially as a solo traveler and a solo female traveler and a solo female disabled traveler that's really scary to be stuck somewhere and especially in you know someplace fairly remote like I was going into the villages outside Harbin and it's not really a place that you want to get stuck So, um, you know, yeah, and I also, um, if the organization partners with um, other rescues in your country, so for me, I saw that the rescue I volunteered with, which is Slaughterhouse Survivors, that they were very transparent on their website and said, hey, here are rescues that we partner with around the world. And so 
on top of me reaching out to people that had volunteered there, I reached out to these rescues and said, hey, how long have you guys been doing, you know, um, working with this organization? Have How many dogs have you brought in? How, you know, who do you talk to? Are, was the, the experience good? Or are you still working with them? And I found a lot of positive response from that. And I know not everybody does, but you, you really have to do your homework because you do not want to get stuck somewhere. And like you said, there are so many people out there willing to take your dollar and, you know, treat you wrong. <laughs> no, for sure. For unfortunately. sure. Unfortunately. I mean, that's just the yeah. way of the world. Speaking of which, do you have to pay to be a volunteer or um, I know so some have... volunteer organizations, you pay them. So, no, I, I mean, I had to pay for my flights there, um, mm -hmm. but some people do, you know, work with a, a rescue here in the U.S. or in whatever country they're bringing dogs in through. So if you're working with a partner rescue and you're doing it with them, sometimes the rescue that you're bringing dogs back to will pay for your tickets. So I've had, you know, a rescue here that I brought dogs back to once for them. They paid for my flights. Um, the second time I did it, I think I paid for my own trip. But then after that, I was going around the world so much, I was just using miles. I was like, hey, nobody, you know, I know you guys are up the up and up and you need to save money and help the dogs. Like, I'll use my miles for this. I'm totally right. fine with that. And accommodations where I was going were so dirt cheap. It was like, that was fine for me because I think the first time I stayed in a hostel there and it was $6 a night. Mm. And then the next time I stayed in a, a pretty nice hotel and I think it was still about $35 a night. So it was not a huge expenditure for me. Um, so I was happy to do it. Uh, but yeah, you shouldn't be paying anybody for the pleasure of shoveling dog poop. <laughs> Cover it. <laughs> Ever. Just general life advice. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I, if somebody's asking you to to give them a bunch of money to come help out and and do chores and, and volunteer with them, that's kind of a red flag for me. Um, but yeah, I, I covering your own expenses to get there, that's not uncommon. Okay. That makes okay. sense. So when you're doing the rescue, it sounds like you have an organization there in the in California that mm -hmm. has partnerships with the people in China. So yes. you're just going and getting the dogs and then coming back to the rescue there and they take over the dogs. Yeah. So the rescue here that I work with, they have volunteers that foster the dogs coming in. And so they want to make sure that they're not going, you know, it's really hard for the for the organization in China to vet people overseas. Because normally when you're rehoming dogs, like you want to get a good idea that they're going to a good home and not just, you know, getting picked up by somebody who's going to, you know, use them as bait dogs or do something, you know, right. not on the up and up. Um, so you want to bring them back and, and work with an organization that's, you know, I'm certainly not going to take 10 dogs into my home as much right. as I love dogs. Right. <laughs> it's like a lot. Um, so they want to take them in, just make sure everybody's medically okay. Some of the dogs coming over because they've been in cargo might get like a little cold or cough or something. So you want to make sure everybody's taken care of, get a good idea of their temperament so that they are going to homes where that's a good fit. And we can sort of describe these dogs um, because coming from where they came from in China, they're in a big safe house with hundreds of dogs and so you know they get you know time in the yard to play but like you really can't suss out like individual personalities a lot of the right. time like you know some of them but to know 300 dogs really really well is a big ask um so when they come here yeah they'll go into fosters with the organization they'll figure out you know is the health what they say they are is everybody okay they go to homes what's the temperament like and then yeah then they have um, people apply and they get adopted out and i stay in touch with some of the the dog owners that have adopted some of the dog actually my mom adopted one of the dogs and my yeah. sister adopted one of the dogs from my flights so that's been a really wow. nice thing to yeah <laughs> and, yeah and, a little and what, friendship. what is their experience i mean have they you know what, what do they think about um, having these dogs, do they, are they just like, these are the best dogs ever? Like how did, you know, from their <laughs> perspective, how has it been turning out? my mom was, my mom was like 90% sure I was going to get, you know, murdered and have my well, organs yeah. harvested when I was, she was like, make sure we know exactly where you are all the time. Like, my, you know, my mom hasn't really left the country very much and often gets scared by some of the places I go. Um, this one, she was a little, uh, skittish about but yeah when she saw the dogs you know me interacting with them and how they came back and, and and she was fell in love with this little Frenchie that was on my first flight and she was like well that's it you know your father and I were like we're not getting another dog we're old I don't I can't whatever and then my dad read a study that people dog owners live longer they and so do. he was like we're getting a dog they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so they, they decided this little girl was for them and she's been absolutely wonderful my dad 
actually had a um, small aneurysm um, a couple months ago. And while he was going downstairs and fell, he's all right now. But um, my mom was upstairs in the back bedroom reading and Goldie, their dog, ran down the stairs and was barking, standing by my dad's side and alerted my mom to come down and get a medical oh. help. So now they're really absolutely in love with this this dog. But she's, sure. been, she's great. She's been absolutely great. And she's another fun story. My my niece, who's about eight years old, when Goldie came over, she was like, I really want to bring Goldie to, to school for show and tell and tell them how Goldie came here. And my mom and, and my sister were like, OK, you can we can do that. We'll take her out and get, you know, the kids all sign waivers that everybody's cool with the dog. But you cannot say that people eat. We're going to eat her. You can't. You're going to scare everybody in the class. Just you right. cannot say that. Right. <laughs> so immediately, immediately, my mom brings Goldie through every. Oh, the puppy getting all excited. And my, my niece goes, can you believe they were going to eat her? Yeah. <laughs> the teacher was like, and we're done. <laughs> like, and it's we're all done. hysterical about it. <laughs> oh, so, my. That is yeah. hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and is that your imagine. sister who adopted one of the dogs? My sister also later adopted uh, oh, one of the dogs yeah she she adopted she adopted this dog that was a really small kind of fluffy puppy ended up being a, a good portion uh newfoundland terrier which is a over 100 pound dog yeah, Quite large. <laughs> yeah big big guy so i think she got more dog than she bargained for but um yeah they have they have a nice big yard so she's she's happy and and the dog has a good home and is really cool with kids and yeah it's been a, it's been a good experience just yeah There's, sometimes you don't know what's mixed in with that that breed they were like it's a lab just kidding <laughs> it's a horse <laughs> I mean, sure. I mean, they have sketchy histories to say the, say the yeah. Words. You don't know. I mean, they're all kept in one big pen. Sometimes there, you don't know who's been mixing with who. So yeah, yeah. you get a little surprised sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like there's quite a mix. And so these are dogs that are actually being raised as livestock, like you said. Um, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's it's a lot of that. It's a lot of also stolen dogs. So um, uh, it's a lot of also they have you know certainly have breeders for pets like we have here. Unfortunately, if a dog doesn't sell when they're a puppy, the worth goes down precipitously. So sometimes these meat dealers will go, or the breeders rather will go. Well, I, I don't want it. It's not going to make money. I'll sell it to the meat truck. So they Aww. then end up on that. Yeah. So all different breeds. It's not just big dogs. Like people assume there's chihuahuas in there. There's bulldogs, there's little Frenchies, there's pugs, there's everything. It's a mix of anything you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. But some of those breeds, it seems like it's hardly worth it. <laughs> I, mean, I know well, that's what I said, but they said they use them in soup. So they're boiled for, oh, this is terrible. They're boiled oh, for stock. Horrible. It's, it's really horrible. So yeah. Yeah. That's just yeah. depressing. I know. I'm sorry. I wanted to be a bright ray of sunshine. and like, how no. to get involved. Well, <laughs> well, actually you are because. Well, the is outcome so is. Exactly. The outcome's good. Yeah. No, I have yeah. a lot of positive news to bring into this. It's certainly, you know, it's the numbers of these facilities are decreasing and luckily the laws are now going on our side so things are turning around slowly but surely um so i'm happy to say that it's not all bleak Good. well it sounds like a very worthwhile thing to do and we applaud you for i mean especially going to china i mean like you said a lot of people are just scared to go there it's a lovely country and it's As a easy tourist. to get around yeah for the most part but i i can see people's trepidation with going to china too to do these types of things i mean that for was, sure you know it's scary too i think especially in places cities like harbin where there's not a large english-speaking population that right. i understand a lot of people would be scared especially as a solo you know um tourist to go anywhere where it's like well i how how easy am i going to be able to communicate how will i get around i don't know this place very well but I've been really fortunate, not just in China, but going a lot of places where I was so outside my comfort zone. And just it teaches you so much about the world and people. And you get an entirely new perspective when you do push yourself out of that, you know, comfort zone. And it's there's more to the world than just going to Paris and seeing the Eiffel Tower. I promise you. That's right. <laughs> That's our mantra. And you learn, <laughs> and you learn so much more about yourself at the same time. You so, really yeah. do. You really, and I, you know, I was scared, as I, I mentioned to somebody who um, is disabled, that I have severe back pain. I've had a number of back surgeries and issues, and um, so use a cane. And it's, it's certainly this negative thirty degree weather is rough on my body. But oh, I'm sure. 
I made it work and I was so happy I did. I was so, so happy that I did. And I, I, it's, I'm not saying that if I can do it, everybody could do it because that's not true. There are certainly a lot of people that can't do it. Um, but I, you know, I was really happy just personally that I could push myself to do something that I didn't know was possible. Well, and I think that's very important, you know, like you said, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, whatever that comfort zone is, and then to help on top of that to to provide a service. I mean, that's just exponentially amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It really was. It really, no, it really is. And I also like, I learned so much just through that, that there are flight volunteers needed all over the world. So even if you're going on a, a trip to Aruba, there are dog rescues there where, you know, you may be needed to help just all you do is carry the dog on the plane or just the dog is going in cargo and you're the person that claims them at baggage and gives them to whatever organization they're going to. So wow. it really doesn't require much from you as a person to do any hard labor. You're not shoveling poop. You're not walking dogs. You're not doing anything, but you're doing something really kind and amazing to a life that is in need. And so I think that's, that's really awesome for people that can't go to these crazy, you know, off the beaten path locations, you still might be able to do something good if you could, you know, just look up the location you're going to and flight volunteer and see if there's an organization that needs volunteers. That's a really good piece of advice. And yeah. and probably a good way for people to start doing it, start feeling comfortable with volunteering is to do something small, and then sort of build yourself up if it's something that you're interested in. Yeah, yeah. You don't necessarily have to jump off the deep end right away like I did. Yeah, <laughs> this I is like a little it. crazy. Yeah. yeah. Some of us have the problem. Like that. So, yeah, baby steps. Um, yeah, baby steps. So is there would you say there's anything in particular that you feel like you've learned during this process? Um I you know, I've I've met some really incredible people. I've learned so much about, you know, like we were talking about in the beginning, I had so many misconceptions about this being uh, you know, why dog meat is consumed, who's consuming dog meat, what the what dogs are going into the the meat market and where they come from. Um, so I've, you know, I had all these notions as a Westerner about just things I'd been fed of sure. like this is this is these are the reasons why and and that this is just horrible and there's little we can do to change it and the fact of the matter is it's not really true and i wouldn't know that unless i went there and i met these people over there doing this hard work um because yeah you just tend to you go oh that sounds reasonable okay wow. <laughs> um yeah yeah and even my friends that I met over there, they're um, the girls that run the organization that I volunteered with. There are three women who came over there to teach English and one from Australia, one from England and one from Ireland. And they became involved with locals that were protesting the meat trade and really helping, you know, rescue these dogs and rehome them. And when they first got there, they were like, we don't see meat restaurants. What are you talking about? That's not a thing. Chinese people don't eat dogs. Stop it. And then once they, you know, got out of the main city region and realized, oh, wow, these places do exist and there are meat trucks and the violence is terrible and people are keeping dogs in horrible conditions and with tons of disease and they're abusing them. They went, oh, wow, it is really true and it's prevalent it's just not in plain sight um so yeah i mean you don't necessarily learn these things unless you're there and you witness them or you're with people that witness them on a daily basis um so yeah i've i've, I've had a lot change in what my notions were of what was going on and how that's really interesting but i think so, that's true when you travel to any country for any reason right. you you learn so much more than you think you might learn. I mean, who cares? Some people do. About the <laughs> history of, you know, the battles of Napoleon. I mean, those are important yeah. things. But for me, that whole cultural side to it and, and learning things that you aren't expecting to learn. I think that's one of the bonuses. Yeah, I urge anybody who's traveling just to stay open to the experience, like more than what the guidebook says. Talk to people you encounter. I've made friends traveling other places and even even in China that people then, you know, my friends have moved and they've gone to other places. I had a friend that, that I met also in China that moved to Australia and, and married an Australian guy. And she's like, come visit me in Sydney. So I'm like, well, OK, I've not been to Sydney. <laughs> now I have a place to go in Sydney. And then that's I have right. locals that live there that show me around and show me a side that's more than just like, there's the opera house. 
house. This is the bridge. This is a kangaroo. Like, it's really cool <laughs> to see stuff that you go, oh, okay, that's not in my guidebook. That's awesome. Now I get to have these this other side of an experience. Well, I actually yeah. have a pretty funny story about that. My daughters, yeah. I told you, the first time I went to China, we, we traveled together, just my two teenage daughters and myself. And the last day we were in Xi'an. Now, Xi'an is a great place to visit, but there's really only a couple days worth of things to do there. Right. <laughs> so you have to sort of get inventive. And we just decided to go get our, our nails done because why mm -hmm. not? And if you think about salons in the States, that's where people go and they talk and they chat. And it was a very similar experience. And we happened to go into the salon that was all women with their daughters. So here's mm -hmm. another woman with her daughters, except I had two. Right. So their first their first statement was, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. Because I had two daughters. Right, and right. And they could only have one child at that time when we went. Now I think right. it's changed. And um, so then we, we sit around. One lady goes running out to get us bean paste popsicles for a treat because it's a hot day. We get invited to this lady's house for dinner. And this is all from just getting our nails done. Because we didn't have a tour to go, you know what I mean? And and you just have to be open to it. So I, speaking of China in particular, I can agree with you that you'll meet really cool people there. <laughs> you really will. I've had it too, like happen in Nicaragua. I've had it everywhere. You know, all, everywhere. everywhere, everywhere. If you're just like a nice person, you'll meet other nice people. Not to say don't go with strangers into weird places alone, but you know what I'm saying. Like, at least, well, yeah, use your brain. <laughs> use you your make brain, a judgment but, call. <laughs> yeah, make you a judgment still... call, but. It's, you can't go through the world not talking to strangers because once you leave your home, everybody's a stranger. Exactly. And you just, uh, yeah, you just have to be open to the experience. No, for sure. I had another <laughs> experience where I was in Japan and we were sitting on the, where the, the subway there and I was with my fiance and he looks up and across the train sees a guy that he thinks he recognizes. Now, we've never been to Japan before. <laughs> Why would we see a guy that we recognize? It ends up that this guy was uh, lived in his dorm his freshman year of college and like left after like a semester, but he recognized him. You're kidding. And this, this, all the place, Tokyo is a huge city and he was like That's come crazy. out to dinner I'll take you to this bar that you know that this well off the beaten path that like no tourists are going to and it's all Japanese people and we had one of the best meals I've ever had and one of the best times I've ever had and it's because we weren't sitting there with our heads in our phone we were looking up and right. saw somebody you recognized and it was such a great experience well that's amazing that's actually that a you would find someone you know <laughs> yeah <That's> just... <laughs> In the in Tokyo on a subway, I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and and good for him to go up and say, you know, the chances are low. Do I but know you? I know he was like, do we know each other from BU in Boston from years ago? And the guy was like, oh yeah, wow, Jim. <laughs> so wow. yeah, we went and hung out. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, we lived in Japan for five years, a total of five oh, did years. Did you? That's so. amazing. That's another wonderful Loved place. It. I you know, we've been everywhere. So yeah. it's it's just awesome. Yeah. I you can make friends in Japan. And I can really picture in my mind, you know, that evening or that night that you had going yeah. out to his favorite bar and oh, restaurant. Yeah. And it was probably we've had those kinds of experiences too. Yeah. It was so it, yeah, it, I mean it was so like here's here's the fish head. You, you have to it's good good luck for company and we're like, oh celebration fish head. Okay. <laughs> we're mm. I'm into it. College is good. Eye. Okay. Yeah, yes, exactly. He was convinced because my, my illness is a connective tissue disorder where I have faulty collagen and he's like, Well, the eye is where the collagen is. You must That's eat it. You so, yeah. so you got the eye. Well that really is crunch, matter. crunch. I wasn't cured, but it was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that is that in the natural world world um that's so true that the eyes of the prey are one of the most nutritious things when we were camping in cap Eye national park where you have all the grizzlies come to the um, waterfalls for salmon fishing right. a lot of the salmon i mean a lot of the bears will just take the salmon eat the eyes out of it and then throw the rest of the fish away yeah once they've wow. had enough meat they'll get the wow. juicy parts and leave they'll the get rest the best there for the seagulls See bears now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Our world is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. So how many trips have you done uh on a rescue mission like that? 
I have now gone six times. Wow. To, oh, yeah, yeah. Some of them just, you know, quick turnarounds in Beijing. I've been three times to volunteer actually at the safe house in Harbin. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's been a lot. <laughs> yeah, wow. Okay. Really so there was a period of time where uh, I was living in California and Corinne and our girls were living in the Netherlands for like oh. a year and a half. So I was making a pretty constant trips back and forth yeah. in and out of skip hole. And at one point in time, the customs there mm. kind of alerted on me saying, wait a minute, this guy's made a lot of trips back and forth now. We need to right. talk to him. So have you had any, any run-ins with customs about that? I haven't luckily, but okay. I will tell you, it has always been a concern. I, because to imagine all of these trips were done in 2019. So that was a lot of time. And especially I was worried doing those quick turnarounds where I was getting dogs and going back because I was spending a day in Beijing and leaving. And no so luggage. I thought, yeah, yeah. I had yeah a, that's, a, I that's a red flag. I had to carry on and I was, I was sure that if anything, that was going to be where I was going to run into trouble, not, you know, standing in the streets trying to block off meat trucks or, or rescue That's animals. Right. I was like, the customs officials are where I'm going to get in trouble. But knock on wood, no, I was really lucky that I never had an issue. But especially the last, like, you know, two trips, I was starting to sweat it out a bit going, oh, they're going to grab me and throw me in a room somewhere and interrogate me. Yeah. But, um, you know, no, I had a I had a 10-year tourist visa at the time. And um, which they don't tell you when you fill out, by the way, tourist visas, anybody going to China when eventually they open borders again, um, you it's not on the form, but you can get a 10 year visa, which is good because you never know when and if you're going to go back to China. And it's nice not to have to file all the paperwork again. That's a um, fact. Yeah, well, that's unfortunate a good tip right there. I know. Yeah, I always go for the max. Why would you pay for the two these forms over and over again? Get get the max. And, and if you go there, great. If not, you know, it costs oh, well. the same. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when like did you take your visa up? Well, so here's the thing. Um, due to COVID, when they shut the borders and forced everybody out, uh, they canceled all the visas. <gasps> so I'd have to go back wow. and reapply oh. when and if I want to go back. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not bad. I live in L.A., so getting a visa is a little bit easier for me because it's consulates right. right around the corner. But, um, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a hassle. It, it stinks. Yeah. but. If that's the worst thing that happened to me, I'm fine with it. I can file yeah, paperwork. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, when was the last trip that you took? You said 2019. What, yeah. The end of the year? So, yeah. So the last trip I took was at the end of November. It would have been right after Thanksgiving. And I really got very lucky because we didn't know that COVID was a thing, but it was already in China. Right, and that's right. the volunteers that went after me, two girls that came back to do bring dogs to the same rescue I work with here in Los Angeles, they both ended up getting COVID. And at the time, nobody knew what it was. And they were like, I've had bronchitis for three months. Something's not right. And then when the news started coming out by March, it was like, we know that's what it was. You know what we had. I was due to, to yeah, I was due to go there in January of 2020. And the girls I was working with in China said, do not come. Something's going on. And so I had been back and forth on, on WeChat with, you know, friends over there and they were like, something's up. Just don't, don't come over here. It's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. And sure enough. Yeah, it was, it was was really scary. Yeah. 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 We contracted it. Sort of the same thing happened to us. Yeah, where where and were you guys? We were we flew to Indonesia, mm-hmm. uh, and Col- December, and late December, uh, and coming back, we came back through KL Kuala Lumpur, right. and there was quite a few flights coming in from China. And you could see was sick. that there were sick people, yeah. and we got back into Japan, and within three days, we I came down all with three the of us. Yeah. All three of us came down with really strong symptoms. Oh, no. Didn't end up in the hospital. Nobody right. knew what it was. Right. But yeah, it lasted for months and months. The, uh, thank goodness you're all right. I, oh, yeah. I can't yeah. imagine that And we that had stress. no idea because it was during the time. That no, like sure. Said, where no one knew. So yeah. Around March, when we started seeing all the symptoms coming out, we'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, we yeah. have that. Check. Oh, yeah. yeah. Check. No, Check. They were sending Another me videos from hospitals over there and how overcrowded things were. And they were like, it's something nobody knows what. And they're not telling us, but don't come here. And yeah. I was like, good, cool. Okay. Trip canceled. I'll, I'm, right. I'll eat the loss. I'm not going. So That's, yeah, I'm, so I'm happy you, I did. Have you been in touch with the, the organization over there? 
since. Uh, lately, yeah. since? How, oh, are they, how are they surviving? So um, things are somewhat back to normal for them. Um, they have a lot more dogs because they haven't been able to fly dogs out. Sure. So they've still been taking dogs in. They've had to purchase a, a second location. Um, but, you know, they're getting on all right. The, the, they have put in lockdown pretty quickly over there if a case develops. Um, yeah. So if, if there's somebody that you, you know, everybody's on their phone, you get an alert, you've been in contact with somebody who's been in contact or, you know, they'll shut down your, your neighborhood. You're not allowed to come in and out. They've, they've really kept cases down to, you know, very, very low numbers. Whether you agree with the methodology of how they do that is a separate issue that I won't get into, but, um, you know, yeah, their numbers are really low. So when we have, again, a lot of people that I talk to have a misconception that things are still rampant over there and you don't want to go. And I go, well, actually it's, It's you know, pretty low. It's they, they really put everybody on lockdown and stopped it, you know, pretty early, which again, you could argue wrong or right, but the numbers are low. Yeah. So, um, but one of here. No, no. <laughs> and one of the girls that was based in, she's from England, she left because her fiance contracted COVID back in the UK. And um, she wanted to go home because he, he had a pre-existing lung condition and she's very worried. When she left, she couldn't get back into China. And due to the fact that they opened borders in the US here for people to come over again from the UK, she just flew in to see some of the other volunteers I was up there with in Portland. And we all met up to go hang out for the first time since 2019. So last weekend we all got together and it was incredible. I was so happy to just see, you know, their faces again. It was so nice. And I wish that I could have seen all the girls from over in China, but I'm happy that I got to see the people that I did get to see because they, they mean so much to me. I went over there so many times and formed these great friendships. It's, it's great that we could all get together in some capacity. I think that's amazing. Portland's always a good place to meet up. Yeah. <laughs> It's just oh a great restaurant. <laughs> it really does. I love it. I love, I love the whole Pacific Northwest. And Portland's great. I, Me yeah. too. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to tell us that uh, we didn't talk about, about the rescue or anything, really? Anything that... Yeah, anybody that's interested in learning more, they can go look up Slaughterhouse Survivors, um, and you can read all about it on their webpage, and they're a phenomenal organization, and if you're not based in the U.S., if you're listening to this in Canada, you could still get involved. Um, They're still looking for flight volunteers if you're somebody that is in China on a work visa of some kind or or Chinese citizen. You can still possibly help out, Um, but yeah, they'll have more details, and you can learn all the stuff that I didn't get to here. And we can find you. Are you on Instagram? You can find me on Instagram, uh, Sick Girl Travels, and you can look at my website, Sick Girl Travels. Thank you. I don't promoted them over me, but yeah. <laughs> look, well, look at me. <laughs> it's a little no. bit of both. Yeah, a little bit of both. No, they're doing all the hard work. I'm just, I'm writing about fun spots. But yeah, j- check me out too, um, especially if you're uh, disabled in any way. I get into a lot of accessibility issues and travel and how to make travel easier for people with disabilities. Well, Jen, we Great. really, really appreciate you coming on. This was something I, I can honestly say in the last half an hour, I've learned a lot more than I expected. So much more than I thought, yeah. <laughs> it's such a pleasure chatting with you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, for thank joining you. Us. All right, well, that wraps up another episode. Thanks for joining us here at Streets and Eats, where we want to encourage you to savor the adventure. We'd love for you to come to our website, Roving Vales, or our sister site, reflections en route and sign up for our newsletters that way you'll never miss a podcast or a blog post and join us on facebook in our private facebook group streets and eats where we talk all things travel get advice from fellow travelers answer questions and just have a great conversation thanks for listening and ciao ciao for for now. now